Okay, so it looks like we have uh, hit like a plateau at 80 people. So I think we can move on and uh, assume that people are joining later or um, they probably won't. So it's my first session. Uh, my name is JB Quizera and uh, uh, I'm a tutor. Um, I have uh, probably met some of you, but um, most of you are seeing me for the first time. So I thought it would be nice to introduce myself. Uh, so I'll be, uh, let me pull this up. Um, are you guys looking at my screen? Okay, can someone confirm that they can see my screen? Yeah. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, yeah. So today we'll be yeah. talking about data science workflow um, because some of you probably have background in software engineering. Some of you have probably done some data science projects. Uh, but there's always uh, like a workflow, like stages that you have to go through from the stage one of a project to the stage, uh, to the last stage to complete the project. So first of all, um, we should probably know what data science is. Um, so data science, most of the time people use it to, you know, when that referring to data oriented decisions, uh, business is making um, decisions from the data that they have. And uh, here we should understand what is data. And uh, so the process of data science uh, uh, basically mimics this uh, pyramid uh, known as also DIKY for data information, knowledge, and wisdom. And what is data? Uh, data is the raw uh, numbers or text characters, basically. If you saw um, these uh, numbers, if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, you see the red and then you see the other numbers, it probably doesn't make any sense. Uh, so that's why it's, it's raw, it doesn't have any meaning. But then the further you go, if you interpret it better, you can, uh, you get information and information is basically data with added meaning, added value. Uh, so you can know the meaning of this, uh, these numbers and this uh, red text. So, uh, this is uh, the example of uh, when you are driving uh, or for a driver. So these numbers basically mean this text, south facing uh, lights on the corner of Pitts and George streets have turned red. So these are um, the, the coordinates of the street and then the red for the traffic light. And then um, as you acquire more meaning for the information, you also give the information, uh, you add some values to the information. And uh, what you get after that is knowledge. Uh, and knowledge is basically information with uh, the- Okay, you know the way you can go for, for I'm sorry about the noise. Yeah, I'm trying to go for clearance, but- Okay. Yeah, so knowledge is the context of information. So here, uh, when you are driving and then you see a red light, uh, you, you, you also look at the intersections, the roads. So here, that's the context. Here you see uh, which road uh, that is uh, that you have to go through. Uh, and then uh, after that, you have to take a decision. That's the final stage and that's wisdom. Basically, uh, like uh, taking action on, on the knowledge that you have. Uh, here, if you see red and then you know where you have to turn, uh, uh, where you don't have to turn, and then you take the action of uh, stopping the car, that's the wisdom. So basically this is the data science in a very, very brief summary. Um, so, and then uh, we can also describe data science in terms of what data scientists do. And uh, data science involves dealing with uh, both structured and unstructured data. And uh, here what you want is to go from unstructured usually, uh, and then you go from unstructured, uh, like for instance, this red and then these numbers, and then you also 
uh, go up uh, the pyramid to get to the knowledge where you can actually uh, acquire insights and make decisions uh, to meet, of course, your business goals and needs. So now that we understand what data science is, uh, we should move on to uh, the workflow of the project. If you're working on a data science project, what stages do you have to go uh, to see the project from the beginning to completion? So one of the workflows, uh, one of the stages, a set of stages that you have to go through is called CRISP-DM. And basically this stands for cross industry standard for data mining. And uh, it's like a standard workflow that was standardized by IBM uh, back in the 90s. Uh, and the stages here are six. It's really very simple. And this, um, the unique feature of this CRISP DM is not that it's, it's not one way. If you, if you can look at the diagram, uh, you have these stages interacting with each other. So it's basically iterative. You go from one stage to another, but that, that does not mean that you can't come back to the stage that you, you, you went through before. So the first stage is business understanding and then data understanding, data preparation, uh, modeling, evaluation, and deployment of the model. So let's look at uh, each of these stages uh, in detail. Um, so this first business understanding here. Uh, so this is the part where you talk to your client uh, uh, or customers and then you understand their needs. Uh, what uh, program do they have? Uh, how can we model this program uh, to, 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 to fit to the reality of the situation? So um, this is where, uh, this is a part where engineers, data engineers, uh, or in software engineering, where people are having meetings with their clients and uh, so that they can understand what they have to do uh, before they even begin. So this is a very important, um, uh, this is a very important stage because if you can't understand the program, it's, it's really difficult to get to the correct solution. So getting to the correct solution is very, very dependent on understanding the program, the business uh, needs. So here, uh, now that you have, you understand the program, you also have to uh, understand how can we measure that we are approaching our solution. Uh, these are basically the, the technical solution. So if you are trying to build a model, a machine learning model, or a data science uh, model, uh, how can we measure that we are approaching this model and that is, is the correct solution? And after that, uh, once you understand the structure of your program, you understand the details about your program, and also you understand how the solution can be achieved, uh, you also make the project plan. So here, you basically describe the tools, uh, the tech stack that you're going to use in each of the six um, uh, stages that you're going to go through. Um, so next, you, we have data understanding. Uh, so after you understand the program, you understand the business needs uh, of, of, of your customers or, client, or clients, uh, you have to collect uh, data. And this is not just any data, of course, you have to collect relevant data. Uh, so uh, for instance, uh, you may be uh, trying to solve the problem, predicting uh, stock prices uh, if you're going to collect data, you want you, pr you probably want to collect data of the stock prices of the past. Uh, for instance, uh, like confidence of, uh, of stock traders, the confidence level, how they feel, uh, because those things influence the decisions which affect uh, the stock price. So you want to collect data which, which can explain your program, your situation. That's what I mean by relevant data. And then you should, after collecting data, you also describe your data. Uh, here, you're trying to understand what variables are in my data. Uh, you're trying to see the structure of your data. For instance, yesterday you were looking at the JSON files. So you look at the, uh, each, each, each line, each data point. What's the structure of the data points? What variables are in, are in each line? Um, so for instance, in the example of the JSON file, you have a set of um, uh, JSON objects on each line. So what are the fields? Uh, is it nested? How, what's the length of each of the arrays, uh, each of the lists, uh, things like that. 
Uh, so after you understand the structure of your data, you can describe it, uh, you go on to exploring the data. Uh, and this is the part where you really um, go deep into the data, you look at the statistics, uh, you do some hypothesis testing, uh, and then you, of course, uh, to do that, you also have to have an idea of how your data looks like, understand the distribution, the what are the outliers, any outliers, and how those would affect the, the data. So uh, this basically is where you uh, use your statistical thinking as a data scientist to uh, have a sense, uh, to feel like, to really uh, understand your data and, uh, and, and, and kind of try to build the mental model before you even build a, a data science model. And then um, now that you have all your data and you understand it, you also have to assess the quality of your data. Uh, most of the time, uh, you may collect data and uh, there's some garbage in, you have to do some cleaning uh, or some of the uh, numbers are missing. Um, and, and you have to look at that and, uh, and make sure that uh, you're not having data which is not of high quality because as they say, um, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, so if you have low quality data, your model is not gonna help even if it's, it's, it's the most sophisticated model. So the next part, the third part is data preparation. Um, so we've, we understand our data uh, we, we, we collected it, we looked at it, we did some statistical analysis on the data, uh, and we assessed the quality of the data. We saw progress on missing values. Uh, we saw some uh, dates which are not formatted correctly. So this is the part where we clean our data. Uh, so uh, for instance, an example here is uh, you might have uh, numbers which are strings. Uh, numbers are not supposed to be strings if you're going to do some uh, numerical operations on the numbers. So you, here is the part where uh, you clean that part. And then you, you might have also collected uh, multiple data sets from different sources. So here you do data integration because you probably want to have one data set uh, to, to work with instead of multiple data sets. Uh, so, and then also uh, you analyze the, um, uh, the features you have in your data. So these are like explaining variables uh, from the example I gave on stock market. Uh, you must have the, uh, uh, the, the, some kind of level of fear of stock traders uh, or confidence. If you have those two, they're probably going, confidence and fear are probably, they're very related. So you might wanna combine those features or probably reject one of them. So this is the part where you do uh, feature engineering uh, to, to combine features or even uh, create features. Uh, so in any standardization, so you should ensure that you have uniform formatting of features across your data. So if some numbers are strings and some other numbers are uh, real numbers, uh, so you should also uh, try to make them uniform. If you want them to be strings, you should all make them all strings. If you want them to be numerical values, you should make all of them numerical values. And uh, uh, this is the uniform, uniform formatting of features, but standardization is like a higher level of uh, uniform formatting uh, because uh, standardization is basically like uh, trying to uh, uh, stick to the status quo of everyone else in the industry. If in the industry, they interpret some features to be numbers, you also want them to be numbers because you're going to publish your data uh, most of the, pretty much like it's after the, to, towards the end of the project. And if someone is looking at your data, they want to not see some unexpected uh, formatting. So this is where you try to uh, format as uh, anyone else in the industry does. And um, so, because I thought uh, in data understanding and preparation, there's a lot of uh, uh, statistics going on. Um, I, I thought uh, I would probably give a brief overview of what kind of statistical analysis that you might have to go through uh, to be able to do those two stages really well. Uh, because if you understand your data, you also understand what models to choose, what models to use the data with. So here, 
you should look at the features in your data and uh, uh, how the, uh, the relationships between those features. And so you, you assess their correlations um, you know, between the features pairwise. Um, and then uh, you may also wanna assess whether there, there are any variables affecting each other. If some variable is affecting other variables, uh, AKA confounding variables, uh, causing um, associations which are uh, artificial, uh, basically, so um, spurious association for the technical term. Uh, the tools used uh, here are uh, the, the heat map. Um, you, ask, you have these tools in your uh, toolbox. Uh, most of the libraries like Pandas, uh, uh, Shibon, they have these um, tools. Uh, so, and then heat map, of course, is, is like a version of correlation metrics. And then pair plots, uh, basically, to see the correlation of, uh, of 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 pairs of variables and how they how they correlate the, the linear relationship between those variables. You may also want to look at um, uh, another thing called so correlation uh, and see if there is an in especially in time series data, uh, because uh, um, an example here, for instance. Uh, uh, the, the stock markets of the past might not be, I mean, the stock markets of the present might not be independent uh, of the stock markets of the past. Uh, basically, uh, in, in a few words, I'm saying the present is not independent uh, from the past. So that's what autocorrelation is. Uh, there is a relationship between the present and the past. The past may explain the present you may want to see if that's the case and how uh, how far back uh, does Monday affect uh, affect Thursday or does Monday affect uh, Friday and so on. And then uh, seasonality is basically uh, looking at the structure of your uh, of of your time series. Uh, so is it uh, probably uh, oscillating like as in a sinusoidal curve? Um, like going up and down, up and down uh, periodically. Uh, so that's the seasonality part. And, and of course, the, uh, it's very important to look at the structure, the overall structure of your data, uh, what uh, statisticians would probably would call distribution. Uh, so um, different kinds of distribution, probably the most famous is the normal distribution. Uh, is it like the, the bell curve shaped uh, data? Uh, do you have like a, a very big bump and then uh, very very small ends uh, for, to the right, to the left, and to the right? Uh, and then um, you may have you might have like a normal distribution, uh, but not exactly like uh, a perfect bell curve. Like you have some data points which are very far to the right or very far to the left. Uh, so those outliers, you might want to check them and see how they affect the overall distribution and probably anticipate how they are going to affect your model. Uh, sometimes you may choose to remove them because they could influence the model too much and, uh, and, 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 and uh, they are not the typical data. They are not the typical uh, 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 data that you're trying to predict. So you may, that's why you may want to remove them. So tools here that you, you most use is uh, the, the box plot, uh, so it's like uh, a box with uh, uh, showing uh, five statistics or number summary. So the minimum of your data points. So if I have uh, uh, stock prices uh, from maybe January uh, 1 to December 31st, uh, what's the minimum stock price? Uh, what's the maximum stock price? What was the median or 20, uh, 25th percentile? Uh, uh, Q1 first quartile, uh, and then uh, the second quartile, of course, is the same thing as the media or 50th percentile. Uh, so that's why I didn't put it here. And then, uh, 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 and then the histograms you want to see uh, again. Histograms also gives you the frequency, like how often did uh, the, this stock uh, trade at this uh, price. Uh, also, that's uh, the same. Uh, job that Barch has helped with. And then um, uh, remember we said that you may want to remove some uh, 
variables, especially if they are causing some artificial, if they are uh, uh, causing some, if they are twisting the data, if they are causing some uh, unnecessary uh, variance in the data, uh, you may want to remove them. And uh, if they don't cause so much, uh, if they don't explain the data very much, uh, you may want to remove them using, uh, and the tool you use here is the principal components analysis uh, or PCA. And what this did, does is, is uh, it looks at the uh, variables in your data, uh, which variables explain the data best. And then you actually take those and ignore the others because uh, one, you may want to decrease the size of, the, of your data set. Uh, as you saw, uh, the data sets you're working with yesterday was uh, over 100 megabytes, but uh, it's not, uh, it's it's just normal to find a, a over one gigabyte data set. Um, so uh, if you don't have too many resources, compute resources, you may want to decrease the uh, size of the data set by uh, using this principal components analysis, doing some feature engineering, removing some um, uh, a necessary uh, variable and uh, including creating new variables which could explain data uh, better. Okay, so uh, the fourth part um, is modeling. Um, and basically the previous three parts are the uh, backbone of this uh, CRISP DM workflow or uh, actually in data uh, science workflow. Uh, you spend like 80% of the time working on preparing data, uh, doing feature engineering. This part here, modeling, which is what people are most most of the time excited to do, uh, is like 20% of the time. So uh, the, the here, you, since you understand the data, uh, you can you can easily uh, decide which models to consider. Uh, you may even come up, come to the conclusion that you only need just one model. Uh, is it a classification program? If you understand your program, you know whether it's a classification program or a regulation program. Um, like a classification program here is basically like uh, um, uh, if you have different kinds of flowers, uh, but you want to detect the, the type of flower uh, automatically, uh, this is a classification program. Uh, you have many uh, big data sets telling you the true type of, car, of, of flowers and you want to predict the type of uh, cars using that data set. So for regression, it's like predicting a number. Uh, this is usually a numerical prediction. Like in the stock, uh, in the stock prices, uh, this wouldn't be a classification program. And if you are trying to predict the stock price, this would be um, a regression program. Yeah, and then uh, there, there's different kinds of uh, regression models, uh, some sophisticated models uh, and some like easy, uh, uh, simple models, but which perform really well. And uh, actually in some cases that perform uh, very sophisticated models. So uh, in the, the simple models are saying uh, like linear regression uh, or, uh, or in general polynomial regression. And then you also should decide on the testing scheme of your data, of your model. How are you going to test your model, the, the performance of your model? Uh, so you might, uh, th 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 there's different kinds of uh, ways you can consider. Uh, you don't train on, you don't test on the data that you train on. Uh, that, that would be like, uh, uh, um, it's like, it's like basically cutting the branches sitting on. So, um, if you're in a tree. So it, it doesn't make much sense. So here uh, you may think of cross validation, which is uh, uh, probably the most uh, used uh, testing uh, scheme. Uh, people split like 20% of the data, they keep it for testing. Um, you know, basically run predictions after the tra after training the model. Uh, you, you, you save it, you save the 20%, train the model, on the 80% and then predict with the 20% and use the predictions to, to measure the, the performance of the model. And there's different kinds of uh, performance metrics uh, that you could choose by whether you use uh, R squared uh, coefficient of determination. Uh, you may wanna see if you can use uh, 
mean mean squared error uh, or uh, root mean squared error, but uh, there's no difference really other than the fact that one is the square root of the other. Okay, um, and then after you split your data and decide on which uh, testing scheme that you're going to, to use, you build the model. And building basically is like calling a function because uh, in I can't imagine, uh, unless you're probably working with neural networks, uh, you are really going to implement uh, the model yourself, like you're going to implement the linear regression model from the scratch. So you use uh, tools like uh, Cyclic One uh, to, to access these models, uh, sets of the art models uh, implemented for you. And uh, and then you, you it's like calling a function from the uh, uh, Cyclic One library or TensorFlow. And then uh, you train the model on the 80% in case in the case you're using cross validation. And then, um, after you train the model, of course, uh, you come back to this uh, second uh, task of testing scheme, and then you actually look at the performance of the model or the models. If you have, if you consider many models, here you see which models are performing better than which models, and uh, is anything could anything be done to make the models perform better? Uh, it, it basically, try to understand where the performance is coming from. One model might have better coefficient of determination, uh, but a worse uh, mean squared error. And then uh, you have to understand what that means. Uh, uh, should we choose a model which has uh, a better R squared, but a, but, but a worse uh, MSC or, uh, or the other way around? Uh, and that comes uh, to understanding what this means. Um, so, but after you've done that, you trained your model, you understand uh, their performance, each, each of the models' performance, you come down to the uh, fifth stage, which is evaluation. Uh, and, and evaluation basically uh, deals most with the model and the project overall. So here, uh, you look at your models, now that you have them trained, uh, you go back to stage one. Uh, do they solve the business problem? Do they actually predict uh, accurately? Uh, how, how is their performance uh, as relevant to the business program? So, uh, and then um, once you understand that which models are solving the business program best, uh, you may choose which models to select, or if you want to select one model, you can choose that. Um, and then you review, uh, you go back to stage one, you review all stages uh, as uh, as regarding the model, the models you have here, uh, asking questions, uh, uh, really being critical about your process, and then um, after evaluation, here you can determine the ne you can determine the next steps. So could it uh, be if you see this er error going to uh, from evaluation to deployment, uh, this is um, like the next step could be deployment or you can do iteration. Are we going to go back to business understanding and then iterate uh, once more? Uh, uh, do we want to try some new techniques, uh, perhaps uh, maybe do some kind of different feature engineering, uh, introduce new features? Uh, if here you are deciding whether you are satisfied with your model's performance, whether they actually solve the business problem, in which case you move on to deployments, or whether we should do some more iteration to find a better model. And uh, basically, uh, the next stage is, uh, you know, uh, deploying the model, uh, putting it in operation. Uh, here, if a company is trying to uh, predict things, uh, but in the example that I gave, uh, stock prices, this is a time where they, uh, uh, they launched the model uh, but before you launch, of course, uh, there is deployment plan. Uh, how is the model going to deploy? Where? What are the technical requirements of deployment? And, that, and then after all that, you can do deployment. There's also the plan for monitoring and maintenance uh, for after deployment. Uh, models uh, may need to be trained again after more data has been obtained. Uh, because uh, the model is as good as, uh, although it's not a, it's not the rule of thumb, uh, 
the model taking train on the model uh, it may mean more a better performance. So if you have uh, more data, you may want to maintain the model. Uh, you probably want to do some feature engineering, so you plan for that. Uh, what the, how are you going to maintain and check the results of the model as the model is operating? And then um, the last two tasks uh, of this uh, uh, workflow uh, is uh, our uh, final reports. Here you, you do basically the final report for the project. Um, uh, uh, this is the thing you publish. Uh, the stages you, you describe in detail each of the stages, the difficulties you miss in the stages. Um, could anything be done better? Things like that. And then in project review, actually, is where you see, you look at things uh, like uh, what went wrong, uh, what did we do good on? Uh, what can we improve? Uh, what should we do next? So here you may explain, for instance, uh, uh, in evaluation, we saw that you may decide to go back and do another iteration. So there is a reason for that. Uh, so in project review, that's why you explain uh, why did I need to, do, to go back? Like, why did I get to uh, data understanding and then go back to business understanding? Something like that. Uh, was it because I probably didn't have enough uh, conversation with my clients or customers to understand the business program? Uh, something because you always want to uh, make sure that, uh, of course, your uh, data science workflow is getting better. You're not wasting too much time. So um, this brings us to the end of uh, this, uh, this slide. Uh, but uh, as, an, as a side note, this business understanding model, I mean, the first stage business understanding uh, is, a, is a very important stage. And um, um, so most of the time you spend so much time on it and uh, Yabba Bell was planning to give uh, another uh, presentation on this. I'm not sure if he's here and ready to give it, but uh, he had an urgent uh, meeting and uh, uh, he'll be giving, uh, to talk on business understanding in the afternoon, if not now. So um, I hope uh, I hope there's questions. Uh, uh, please uh, raise them. Hello. Hi, I just want to say okay. uh, something real quick. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, very nice uh, tutorial. Thank you. A very great introduction. What I what I want to say is I'm not sure whether the CRISP DM is a uh, is a set of steps, is a set of uh, steps mm -hmm. to do. Uh, data science or data uh, mining, or it's an actual, yes. or is it an implementation? Like, uh, like there is a thing, there is actually software or a web-based program or a platform that mm -hmm. helps us implement CRISP, or it's just a. Uh, I think it's it's a concept, right? It's not. Yeah, it's a. It's not an implementation product. It's what you said. Uh, first uh, it's a set of stages which is what workflow is called it's a set of stages you go through it's basically like a guide you know when you have like a, it's like a recipe yeah, yeah. for a data science project if you're going to cook uh, you probably look at um, how long am i gonna uh, cook these things stuff like that so that's what uh, uh, the crisp dm is it's a guide Yeah, thank, thank you, you very for much. the question. I, I, I thought that was the reason to. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, hey, JB. Hi. Uh, uh, thanks for the great presentation. Okay, okay you removed the. the... Sorry, 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 let me bring it. Okay. 
Yeah, I just want I just want to ask about that CRISP uh, the the data science life cycle, the CRISP DM. Uh, between uh, business understanding and data understanding, maybe if you could discuss a little bit about it in like in more details, uh, like which one comes first when we are we want to tackle a data science problem. Maybe if you could discuss about that. Hello? I cannot, uh, I can hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, I was muted, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, can you hear you? Yeah, I was saying uh, business understanding always comes first if uh, if you are following uh, uh, CRISP DM. And really, uh, it comes first, I, I would, I would, uh, I venture to say that it comes first for any workflow. Uh, if you are trying to solve a problem, you first want to understand the problem before you get the, uh, what's going to give you knowledge uh, to uh, solve the problem. Because data understanding, again, um, is, is about this, this pyramid. Uh, you get the data, you, you get information, knowledge, uh, which is like uh, this information here is like, when you're doing statistics and knowing the minimum the maximum and then knowledge is like when you have uh, probably decided let me, let me put my computer in charge okay so um again as i was saying uh, business understanding comes first because you want to understand the problem you're, do, you're, you're dealing with before you can take any uh, step to solve it and uh, 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 Yababel, uh, as I said towards the end of my uh, talk, uh, is going to come later and uh, describe business understanding in more details. Great, thanks. Okay, mm. are there any more questions, please? Uh, I think some people have raised their hands. Yes, yes, Kevin. Okay. Okay, yeah, Kevin is asking when is it, when is prediction made? Um, and the uh, prediction is made when you're doing uh, modeling on the modeling part. Uh, so this is after you've trained your model, you predict only after you've trained the model because you can't predict on a model which is untrained uh, because you, to create the model, uh, you create it and then the model is basically like empty. And then you train it. Uh, training it is like giving it knowledge, understanding of, of your data. Um, let, me, let me come here. So here you build the model. And when you build the model, it's like giving birth to like a baby. A baby doesn't know anything. And then training it is like teaching the model uh, from your data. And once you teach the model, um, the model understands the structure of your data and can infer, make inference about any new data which it has not seen before. So in the modeling uh, stage is where you come and then you, um, uh, you, you train and then when you are assessing the performance of the model, that's when you predict, you predict uh, because the predictions, uh, for instance, let's say um, uh, the stock price today is a uh, hundred dollars and then um, my model predicts that the, the, the uh, the stock price is going to be uh, like say uh, $200 tomorrow. Uh, 
Uh, and then it is uh, like, it doesn't change. So that model is not accurate. When it does it over time, like when you see, when you uh, predict on many, um, like you have thousand data points, uh, and then you, you, you predict on those data points, you can assess the accuracy of the model. If it predicted like 90% of the time, the model predicted uh, correctly, like it's within a small range, uh, then uh, uh, you know that your model is performing well, uh, depending on how you define well. Uh, so yeah, training the, the predict the prediction part happens in, uh, in when you're assessing the models or the model performance after you've built and trained the model and you assess the model's performance using these uh, uh, metrics, which you find in libraries. Uh, okay. And then uh, let me answer quickly these questions in the chat and how really it's made. Um, yeah, you make a model by basically calling a function. That's how you build the model and then um, by calling a, initializing a class. Uh, and then you train it by uh, calling a function on the class, which is usually, usually called fit. Uh, it's called fitting the model, not training. That's why you have the terms uh, like overfitting the model when the model is uh, uh, predicting too well to be true uh, or underfitting the model and the model is predicting too badly uh, to be true or acceptable. Uh, can you go through the classification stuff in modeling, please? Uh, yeah. So classification here um, as, uh, yeah, for classification, I was giving an example of uh, uh, what kinds of model you may want to consider. So I gave the example of uh, if you're trying to uh, 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 classify the type of, uh, of an object, for instance, uh, there's a like a famous data set on uh, California housing where people pre, uh, predict the uh, I'm, and I'm going to use this for both regression and classification where people predict the price of a house based on past pri uh, prices and the the, the the features of a house like the number of rooms uh, the the uh, the size of the house things like that things that can ex explain the price of a house. So if you are predicting the number, the numerical value of, uh, of, of the house, the numerical value price of the house, uh, and you, for instance, you get like, I don't know, $400,000, that's a regression because you are getting a number. And then if you are predicting, for instance, I want to know if a house is in this range, if a house costs between uh, this amount A and this amount B, you are classifying a house in a range that's that would be classification yeah uh, although that's that I, that that could be confusing but uh, uh yeah i hope you get the, the the sense of this okay uh what are the major issues we should consider to decide on uh, the modeling technique yes um yeah so uh, in the statistical thinking, when you are doing understanding of data and then you know the distribution of your data, you know the maximum, the minimum, the statistics, you visualize your data, uh, you may, uh, uh, for instance, uh, see that your data, uh, you can also do scatter plots and then you may see that your data is probably like a line. Uh, then you can use linear regression. It's like a curve, uh, like a polynomial, you may want to do like for a more general, general case of uh, uh, linear reg regression for like a higher degree polynomial. Uh, so that's when, uh, once you visualize basically your data and you understand your data, you can know, you, you have the intuition of which model to choose. Uh, and you may have, um, uh, if you're doing classification, you may have data with uh, uh, different uh, um, uh, sets of objects, uh, like you have houses, like a hundred houses in this range, hundred houses in other uh, range. So you may want to do uh, 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 like uh, other models, like uh, uh, like forests uh, to see 
to, to classify uh, or uh, uh, Bayesian uh, classification models to see uh, the ranges of uh, of uh, of your objects or houses in this case. Uh, what techniques does one use when the data set is not enough? Yeah, so here um, some people use data augmentation, but this this is mostly the case in uh, computer vision uh, because it's easy. Uh, for instance, if you're doing computer vision and your data sets are actual images, you can flip image images like a flipped image, maybe rotated 90 degrees or 100 degrees or whatever number of degrees. It's not exactly the same as uh, as the image uh, as the original image. So that that augmentation is a uh, is very famous in computer vision programs. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm answering Martin's question on techniques to when someone ha doesn't have enough data. Uh, another thing, when you don't have enough data, you can uh, consider increasing the number of features you have. Uh, uh, for instance, you may be predicting, uh, um, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, health of people. Suppose there is a measure of health and then you probably have weight. Uh, you may also want to see, uh, calculate other features like uh, uh, height, like body mass index. So here you are increasing the number of features through feature engineering. Yeah, it's, uh, this, is, uh, this is tough to say. When do you say that the data set is not, it's not large enough? Uh, I really, uh, yeah, this is, I wouldn't say, um, of course, uh, for, for some size of data set, like 100, if you have like 100 data points, that would be small uh, for uh, any program, uh, really. Like if you have 100 data points, a 1,000 may be also still small. But uh, if you have like uh, uh, gigabytes above, uh, for regular uh, business needs, if you have 100 gigabytes of uh, that's a set, uh, not, not a hundred, like above like tens of gigabytes. That's probably enough. Uh, and it depends on the business needs uh, of, uh, of your customers and clients, how robust you also want your model to be, how stable you want it to be. But there's no uh, uh, correct answer for how large the data set should be to be considered large enough. Let me look at... Uh, Okay. Yes, uh, Nigist. Uh, Nigist, you have your hand raised. Okay. Um, yeah, I suppose we, uh, we probably went over time, right? Um, uh look at uh, one uh, we we still have like five minutes uh yeah i was i was afraid that we we're going over time we still have five minutes please if you have any question um because I think in one of the upcoming tasks, if it's not for today, is building like a work, uh, a flow chart of a, of a data science model. Uh, you can uh, like that uh, cycle diagram that I gave is an example of a flow chart. So if you have any question on any of these things, uh, you should really uh, please ask. I think they are very yes, nice. Yes, Prince. Is it, was it Prince? Yeah, sorry. I think um, I had a, a question earlier, but it was, it was captured. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, Kevin. Okay. Okay, 
Michael is asking, can we say data science is like a cleaner uh, for the data we give for our ML? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because data science most of the time deals with, uh, when you talk about data science, you're thinking of uh, basically scraping the web for data, getting unstructured data and giving it format. Uh, and when you think about machine learning, you're thinking of uh, training algorithms. Uh, uh, and you, you are not, th the focus with machine learning is not as much on data, uh, cleaning data, preparing data, as it is on training models and building models. So, um, yeah, I would say that science is, uh, is like, uh, like a pre-stage for machine learning. And uh, Biniam is asking, what exactly is the difference between data analysis and data science? Yeah, data analysis is part of data science. Um, because uh, when you talk about data analysis, uh, people think about uh, giving meaning uh, to uh, the data you have, analyzing data and, and probably having some actionable knowledge, uh, like uh, knowledge that you can uh, uh, get insights from and then uh, make a decision. So data analysis involves statistics, uh, visualizing uh, that statistical thinking. But data science involves all those things we just saw. Uh, this uh, uh, collecting data, uh, data ana analysis doesn't involve collecting data, uh, but data science involves collecting data, uh, preparing data, uh, those sorts of things, and also doing models. But data analysis does not involve doing models. And yeah. Yeah, exactly, Musa. Thanks. Yeah, Musa is saying uh, machine learning is a uh, step in the data science pipeline during the modeling part. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, the other thing is uh, I put these slides in the folder for today, Tuesday. Uh, so if you probably uh, wanted to look at something again, you can find them there. Um, Uh, Nikis, it looks like uh, the um, the recordings uh, will be being published the next day. Um, so the recording for today is not going to be published today, as the recording for yesterday is going to go out today. So um, I don't remember where the you can find them. Uh, Musa, do you remember? Or if someone has been able to access. Uh, sorry, JB, um, please uh, come again. Do you remember where the recordings? Yeah, yeah. The record, I was asking where, where the recordings should be found. The recordings should be found on the YouTube channel the next day. So the recordings for today will be there tomorrow. Yes, I, I think that's correct. Uh, but I think we can confirm with Abdullahi uh, about that. But I think it's correct, yes. Yeah, the tech team can help us uh, on that. Yes, you are correct. Yes, this regard will be uploaded today. And today's one will be uploaded tomorrow. Okay, so uh, if you have any questions, please send them in the chat, uh, channel week zero. Uh, yeah, I guess 12 uh, 
uh, or uh, what 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. UTC brings us to the end of uh, this tutorial and uh, have a good rest of your day, everyone.